Hi, I'm Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos, writer and co-publisher of Event Horizon Stories of No Turning Back, a sci-fi, sensual, and literary collection of stories themed around the lure of black holes and their unforgiving boundaries. You can find us live on Kickstarter until May 10th, 2024. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, my name is Chris Allo. I own Magnus Art, a full art agency. I'm also a writer and editor. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Magnus Arts Group. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by two extremely talented people. One of them has been on the show in the past. She's, of course, a very talented comic creator, as well as an advocate in the health industry, among many other things that she's done. And of course, we have a an amazing talent from Magnus Arts, and I'll let him describe his side. Hope <laughs> We are joined by the ever-talented Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos and Chris Allo, talking about Event Horizon stories of no turning back. How are you both doing today? Excellent. Doing, doing great. Good to see you again, Kurt. Good to see you too, Stephanie, and welcome to the show, Chris. I'm sure we'll have a wonderful conversation talking about this amazing project here, uh, so I can't Thanks. wait to dive into it. Yes, me too. Great to be here. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Who are we starting with, Kurt? <laughs> you, you flipped the camera. I'm talking, so I'm going to start. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. My name is Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos. I am the uh, writer and co-publisher of Event Horizon, Stories of No Turning Back, publishing with my imprint, Janice Point Press a sci-fi, sensual, and literary collection of stories themed around the lure of black holes and their unforgiving boundaries. Very excited to be here. This book is told in multi-genres, multi-mediums, comics, prose, original canvas work, photography. I'm a writer of prose comics. I'm a zinster. I'm a volunteer librarian. I'm a mom to Amazon, so I got a lot of hats, and I'm excited to talk about this book. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Allo, and I run Magnus Art. Basically, what I do is um, I have a group of artists that I manage and represent. We basically work on various projects, such as Nina's, where it could be a comic, it could be a prose, it could be poster art, it can be any type of art that you need. And I basically look for clients for my artists and uh, manage sort of the process. I also do freelance editing, and I have a little blog I do on the GSAT website, which is a sort of a gay run and nonprofit. And I do interviews with queer creators. That's amazing. I love this. Just means that we'll have to have you back on the show to talk about that. So now you've just scheduled yourself for a future interview. So absolutely. absolutely. I love to. That's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> we can do it in June. Oh yeah. Pride month as well. I haven't had a pride month on the show in a long time. So that'll be a great starting point. So perfect. That'd be great. Yeah. Beautiful connection. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. See, see, Stephanie, you're bringing people together and you didn't even realize it. Crazy. <laughs> as a writer, art director, and co-publisher, you've been involved in numerous numerous projects from health to the creative mediums of comics and beyond. How does Event Horizon compare to your previous works, especially the ones that you've been on the show for? And what inspires you to explore the theme of black holes in this short story collection? Oh, fun question. First off, Event Horizon is definitely accumulation of all my years of work, whether it's recurring themes that I write about, whether it's because I'm including previously published work, whether it's me including work that I just never published, as well as new work. The first thing that sets this apart as um, something totally different for me is simply its length. I've been fortunate to be a part of wonderful anthologies, both comics and prose. This is my first full book length work that I'm putting out where I'm the writer of all the pieces. So 240 pages, full color. And that's a biggie for me. It's something I always wanted to do. Definitely a novelist first. That's just my instinct and how I write. Um, so it's nice to get a full length book out. I think also what makes this very different than Horizon is that it actually combines in one book, all the genres and mediums that I write in. I have work represented under my zinester visual artist name andromeda there's actually a piece uh in there where it's a canvas work still crudely cut things that i do that i digitally modified so you get that aspect of me as an artist you have the janice point press representation of what i do which represents more of the artist books books that are crafted in a way where their formation itself is part of the storytelling i think you see this in the three variant covers that i have for this book whether it's the karen 
Venus Darbo cover that's going to be foil stamped. Everything's hardcover. So we're doing quality, Janus Point Press. The Armando Ramirez cover, which uh, has customized end papers in its print format, as well as digital. And then, of course, the Bluster One, where you're going to get, based uh, on artwork of an original canvas work, that has textured feeling. So just that aspect is me combining the Jan Janus Point Press. For me, Stephanie, as the writer, this is definitely my first work where I'm openly highlighting the female experience. Each work either up front or has seeds of that perspective. Even when I'm inhabiting and inviting a male gaze, you still get that uh, in this work. And it's a piece that I'm very open in my sexuality, in women's sexuality, in human sexuality. I joke that my professional career, I have a degree in a uh, master's in public health and its focus was sexual and reproductive health. Somehow I worked 15 years in childhood obesity instead. That's just how life works out. I guess if you do one, you might get the other. <laughs> it's nice to return to the Venusian themes in my life. So why black holes? You know, I've always been fascinated with astrophysics. I think it's like the George Costanza for anyone that watched that show. You know, he always pretended he was an architect. Well, <laughs> you know, that's like my little alter ego. In college, I had a bulletin board and had a picture of an ice dancing couple and the NASA space shuttle. And I think that represents me as uh, the two sides of me of wanting to artistically express myself. I love dance, but I just love expressing myself. Just this love of space. Um, nobody told me that I could be an astrophysicist. I thought I had to be an astronaut. Didn't work uh, out. I don't even have a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> just having this innate love of astrophysics. Specifically, I will say black holes, I mean, they are intriguing. I mean, they just warp our sense of reality with their intense gravity. They raise questions as what, you know, what is this life? You know, there's a holographic principle of black holes uh, make, suggesting that our life is, we're just like a hologram. Black holes strip us to our bareness. Uh, they spaghettify and stretch us to our little particles. And, you know, they're a mystery. We don't know what's inside of them. And humans are drawn to mysteries. I mean, like we can think of our whole life here as why, why are we here? What is that? So it's just a ripe metaphor for storytelling, specifically <clears throat> for human decisions and no turning back from them. Existential question before, before coffee is always, why are we here? Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> As a manager with Magnus Arts, one of the teams that worked on this collection and overseeing your group of artists, what unique challenges and opportunities occurred managing this artistic team for a collection like Event Horizon? This is a good question. You know, when a client says, I do have an artist or I have a project, I sort of see who's kind of like what they're looking for stylistically and see if I have any artists that match that, you know, kind of description or feel. And then, you know, present it to the client, in this case, Stephanie. Depending on the client's experience, like if they worked with a sequential artist or if they worked, worked with artists at all before, I just kind of ask them, what do they need? What are your needs? Do you need me to be a little more hands-on with you? So it all really all depends. You know, Stephanie wasn't as experienced in sequential. So one of the artists, Eric Nguyen, did a five-page sequence of sequential art. It was a little more sort of like talking with him about layouts and stuff like that. And then making sure, you know, Stephanie liked what he did, but also understood that there was a story narrative in, in these particular pages, um, making sure the story made sense. The rest of the art, I think, were mostly images, you know, single images. And I'd sort of chime in here and there saying, hey, can you do a little bit more of this to make the colors pop or, you know, outline the characters so we can see the character since it's on a cover or it's a specific piece focused on that character, making sure the character pops. I mean, there's all these little things that if you're not used to working with artists specifically for, you know, artwork that's going to be in a book or on a cover you want to make sure that the art pops out but also the character stands out the story narrative flows the colors are right you know what there's all these various little things yeah it, it could be minimal to a lot of sort of input from me but the artists know what they're doing in most cases <laughs> because you've done this for a while and because you've had a managed a variety of artists compared to say other projects that you've worked on or worked with how does that compare to what you did with event horizon well, this was unique in the sense that like she kind of had a need for sort of a gamut of type of artist. So she needed an illustrative artist, she needed a sequential artist, she needed a cover artist. What else? There was a spot illustration, just so, sort of all the narrative art. She had a, she ran the gamut of the needs of a narrative artist, which was kind of interesting because generally it's either maybe a cover art and sequential art, um, but never like that many types of art in one book. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of cool to sort of have 
all of that going on at the same time. Your work often incorporates elements of social commentary and personal introspection. How did you infuse these themes into the stories featured in Event Horizon, particularly within the context of cosmic exploration? Great question. I'm definitely always presenting plot and character arc within the context of human history. It's just how I write, and that's a theme that always comes up, specifically within the collection. For example, the Andromeda comic that the book opens up with, with Seth Christian Martel, I flipped the script of Andromeda as the bound princess ready to be sacrificed on what she actually does with those chains. Being true to the historic roots that Andromeda was described as dark-skinned and the Renaissance uh, whitewashed her. So we have a white Andromeda. So you see in the skin tone of Andromeda in that comic. While infusing cosmology and the idea that we are going to eventually merge with the Andromeda galaxy, and I just sexualized it. <laughs> <laughs> so having fun with all those things, the human history and cosmology and pleasure. In the case of Space Invaders, I think this is a very great example to answer your question. That's a story that uses the colonization of Puerto Rico, the arcade game and pop culture of space invaders, a woman's assault, pregnancy, miscarriage, all of those things, being a veteran to a Vietnam, as a statement on the complexity of what one does with space. What's ours to take and where does choice lay? Those crucial questions that I think are, are crucial, especially for space uh, exploration. And I should say Space Invaders had graphic uh, art from Aaron Guzman, who is also the book designer for Event Horizon. For the story, The Fold, which had story cover art by um, Chris Delara of Magnus Arts, that's a story that features characters living through humans' ability to constellation hop, a human love story and drama where a guy and a girl decide, you know, what's more important to them, their love or just making that next jump to the next constellation, the Andromeda galaxy even though it means there's no turning back from it. There's no way for us to get back. It's a story that makes a commentary on sometimes we carry more weight in our hearts than in our cargo space and the risks of not looking at human history and some of our folklore on lessons learned. You know, I could go on with more stories, but this is how, how all my work deals with infusing social commentary, but also being fun and sci-fi at the same time. And even public health angles, space invaders dealing with fertility, miscarriages, all that sort of thing, gentrification. You really find everything. <laughs> Event Horizons offers readers both a written and visual feast with a diverse range of prose and artwork. Can you share your favorite story and art from this collection? And what does it mean to you? I always, I, I never like to like your favorite from this collection. It's, it's always like, oh, I don't want to offend anyone, but like, um, I don't know. I mean, I think all the pieces are great. Even, I mean, Stephanie showed me a, a copy of the book that had the other art that I wasn't involved in. And it's all really great and strong pieces. I don't remember all the stories that I, <clears throat> that I read. I don't think I read all the stories. In terms of the art that we did, her and Starbucks cover is just absolutely gorgeous. And she's amazing. And I know, wasn't shocked that Stephanie wanted to work with her. Anton's piece turned out to be, I think Anton's, I think this is the piece that Anton, X enough that, that Stephanie mentioned, I think it was the first piece that we actually worked on together as, as a team. And it turned out to be really, really beautiful. Eric's sequential pages were great because Eric does pencils, inks, and colors. So it's great to work with somebody like that because it's just one-stop shopping. Um, and Eric has a really dynamic style. And Crystal Lara is just great. She loves doing female characters. And she's a real natural, fine artist. She does pencils. She paints. She works digitally. She's a true artiste. I will say that. <laughs> and Canadian-based, if I might may add, Kurt. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, she is Canadian-based. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, it's really hard to pick a favorite piece. Once I saw the whole package, it just turned out really great. Plus what um the book designer did with Karen's cover where he did the split image, the dual image that Stephanie used for a poster just really made me love that piece even more because of just the way that turned out. <laughs> just, you know, the cool sort of the tag cover that she did for the book is really great. So there's just a lot of great pieces. Stephanie really, as a relatively new art director, I would say, she did a great job with coming up with. Thank, thank you, Chris. Looking through the version that I've seen here, and I'm sure the final version is going to be even, even more incredible than it already is. I can't wait to see between the beautiful colors, between the various artists. It's hard enough to get a comic writer and an artist together to work on a collaborative project. It's when you have multiple teams working on a single collection of amazing short stories with all the mediums that are included in this, herding cats doesn't even come close. <laughs> that's that's the favorite term to use for comic. Yeah. Sometimes 
I have to think that my years in public health, I just somehow am always leading a volunteer force of doing a social marketing campaign. So my, my big thing was leading this big social marketing campaign. Yeah. And it was all volunteers. So if I can work with just volunteers that aren't getting paid, that are invested, I I, I have to think that helped me actually working with artists that have contracts. But I think key is patience and being accepted to everyone's lives and schedules, I think is cr crucial and key. Yeah. And then if any one of my guys are falling behind, I'd just be the bad guy and go offline and say, hey, get this in because Stephanie needs it. <laughs> <laughs> Which really, oh, yeah. really, really didn't happen. But maybe a little <laughs> nudge, but nothing critical. <laughs> yeah. The short story collection Event Horizon features stories and art that delve into the human experience, often through the lens of speculative fiction. How do you believe science fiction and fantasy can provide insight into our own reality and humanity? Mm. So like Mary Poppins says, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. I think that's what she said. <laughs> helps the medicine go down. <laughs> oh, okay. Helps. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> I, I knew I should have Googled it right before I went on. <laughs> With sci-fi, it's an easier angle to address complex and hard issues, especially in human history and our challenges. We can more easily inhabit different points of view and perspectives and take the role as observer. I think sci-fi reminds us of our limitations as humans and our human potential, an opportunity to change the course of history if we don't want to you know, arrive at a particular future. And I think sci-fi, particularly for marginalized communities, it reminds you of how otherized you can feel, right? We talk about this with X-Men and feeling like being a mutant. So it's a nice reminder to be like, hey, do you feel like this alien? Or is your society making you feel like this? And sci-fi is just, there's just so fun to do. There's just total freedom. You could be free from human history and just, you know, make up this whole new worlds and galaxies. Working with the team of talented creative people for Magnus Arts is amazing. Out of the people you worked with on this project, can you describe why these people selected were perfect for this collection? This is just another situation where Stephanie gave me descriptions of the story and in some cases gave me what she wanted in terms of an art style, but not for each of the uh, projects. So I just sort of offered up who I felt would be great, like Anton does great paintings, or he does like fantasy. So take into consideration some of what the artist wants to do. I mean, if they're not really feeling a project, I'm not going to make them do it. You know, I'll just try to get as much information about whatever specific project it is and sort of offer up what I have that I feel can give the client what they want. And sometimes I'll have people do like a sample piece just to make sure that like, I think this guy can do it or this, you know, this person can do it. Casting is really important in comics. So you want to make sure you're giving the right artistic style, right artist for the story. And that's just something I learned when I was back at Marvel working with editors, just because someone is great and you love their style doesn't necessarily mean they're right for the project. So casting someone who's appropriate for the project in tone, style, is important. It could be either me sort of saying, I think this person would be great, or the client saying, hey, I want somebody that's like Art Adams or Olivia Coypel. And then if I have something, I'll say, hey, here it is. Or I'd say, sorry, I don't have that. And go from there. When it comes to the creativity of a big publisher like Marvel versus an amazing indie publisher like Stephanie, yeah. what has more creative freedom? Definitely the indie you know, the indie creator, just because, I mean, it's for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, Marvel obviously has a certain, I don't want to sound like a snob, but there's a certain qualitative level. There's a certain sort of refined look to the art that they're looking for, for their projects. As an indie creator, someone who may not be as entrenched in what's appropriate comic work or mainstream comic work won't have that sort of restriction in their head. So they're just like, oh, I like this art. It's cool. I mean, even I know I've kind of been sort of a little brainwashed by working at Marvel. Like I, I can only work with artists that I feel are on a certain level, but that's sort of tapered off a bit because today there's a lot of indie creators out there and they don't necessarily adhere to that, you know, sort of restriction or way of thinking in terms of like your art has to look a certain way. I'm glad I'm happy to be sort of in this, in this sphere now because I can work with different art, different types of artists. And it's also cool to know that like, there's a lot of people out there. They like all different types of art. So you kind of got to give the client what they, what they want or, you know, suggest something that I might feel is different or better <laughs> in a sense. And maybe not better in terms of style, but better in terms of st telling a story, being able to sort of depict an image that's clear, somebody that's, maybe that's a good cover artist versus an illustrator or an interior artist, but that's also a very specific skill. I'm learning a little bit from these indie creators and hopefully they're learning a little bit from me in terms of learning how to work with a specific artist that'll help you sell your book or do an appropriate cover image to really make your cover stand out, whether it's in a bookstore or a comic store or whatever online. It's kind of like a learning process for all of us. The indie artist is definitely a lot of fun because they're just much more open. 
this played out in Event Horizon because there were a number of pieces where I'm like, that's great. And then Chris as the agent's like, actually, you got to add this, you got to add. And I'm like, dude, it's done in my head. I didn't interfere. But <laughs> then when he coached his artists to just do these little final touches, these are things that, you know, not privy to, not expect and polishing. So it was great also working with Chris in that aspect to have that kind of, of getting the work to a different level. Your collaboration with not only Magnus Arts, but these other teams, how did their contributions add to the storytelling that you've put together with Event Horizon? Okay, great. I'm excited to answer this question because there's just so many elements. I will start out reiterating uh, Aaron Guzman, the book designer, also illustrator of many pieces, my cousin, my comics guy. Um, he did a tremendous job with helping me get all these pieces look unified in the design and adjusting his art as he saw art coming in. Shout out to Aaron Guzman, who is very much a part of even why this book exists by nudging me, you need to do a collection. Literally why I'm doing this is because my cousin said, you need to do your own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it from like Bluster One. So Bluster One, James Alicea, is the artistic inspiration for the look of Event Horizon. He is the cover artist for the canvas you see behind me. That's the original canvas work. His artwork tends to be black and orange, colors of that we assign to a black hole with the accretion disk being orange. And he had a particular canvas. He had two. I don't know if it was Christie's that had it on auction. It's still on his website. Uh, well, one, one of them is. And I was so taken by this piece. So this is a, a, an artist that we personally collect and have a number of his, his artworks. I wanted to do a book with that cover. Like that was my, <gasps> wait, my cousin said to do this. Now this is the look. So Bluster's one's canvas work and then commissioning an original one for this book is really what set the tone for then the storytelling. It set the energy. Um, if you can see, there's drips. His work, it just inhabits that kind of weirdness. Black holes spaghettify you. They stretch you. So his artistic vision, I take that energy. You'll see there's energy being pulled, pulling you to turn the page. You'll see certain elements. So that definitely informed how we told the story. In Aaron's case, for one of them, I wrote Ortiz Funeral Home based on my cousin's always just drawing, you know, I guess you artists like to warm up. I don't understand this concept. If I write it's a masterpiece, that's the end, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> but like artists, like I'm joking, artists, you know, they do warm up activities. And I just collect my cousin's trash. He calls it trash. I treasure it and I publish it, right? Um <laughs> <laughs> his black book as a teenager. He started drawing these cyborg, women cyborgs. And at the time I was visiting the Julia de Burgos Cultural Center and there were always these handouts. This is a very long way to answer your question. There were these handouts on this type of revolutionary communist cyborg feminism. Like, this is very extreme. You know, our goal is to like just be cyborg women, you know, make the babies in the chamber. Like it, it was just really fascinating. I put all of those things together and made a story. So very much driven by Aaron's art, which doesn't always happen, right? You think of a writer and you write a script. I was inspired by this art and then seeing this very type of feminism. All right. So that's one way to get to Magnus art. I needed fresh art. I loved the fact that he had established artists and different styles. Like I have my artists that I have connections with that are known, established, not known, but I was looking for particular pinup quality for this book that was missing. First, Chris is a great salesperson. We're on an online forum together and he's good at pitching himself. So kudos to you, Chris. I wouldn't have met you. I think his pieces particularly add a sense of fantasy and pinup quality and sexuality that I needed for my stories. You know, some of these prose stories are very sensual, maybe sometimes erotic. And, you know, you can only do so much with prose in the beginning. Like you might have a spectacular uh, title that might you know, entice you to read more. But when you have cover art, that kind of gives you that punch to say, ah, this is what I expect, right? Like these are some cool details of the story. You know, prose, I need a reader that's committed, that's going to take the time to give me a chance by pairing with Chris for some of these stories, because every prose story has artwork. Um, I like to say when I read to kids, the fifth graders in the library, picture books are not just for kids. It's not just for little, you know, we like picture books, <laughs> even as adults. Chris's uh, artist de delivered an emotional punch uh, uh, for my stories. You know, sometimes there are stories that needed art and sometimes it was art that commanded a story out of me. You know, I think she kind of 
sort of tied into the idea of proper casting, you know, getting somebody to sort of give you that visual edge to drive home the point of what your, your prose story is, you know, just give that little bit of, oh, in case people are like, oh, I'm not quite sure what this is. Oh, that's what it's about. It's, it's right there in front of my face. Plus we're visual beings. That's a very human quality. I, I wanted to highlight Karen S. Darbo's cover. I couldn't believe she didn't read the book to execute something that so much speaks not just to the beauty, the art, the outside, but the emotions of the book. Can I say it's a it's a woman that did the artist? Like I selected her not just for artwork, but if you look at her profile, I think it's like, I love women and aliens. I mean, perfect. So part of it is selecting the right artist. But I have to say that as having that as a lead cover speaks to me, not just as a comic book girl, but just as a prose writer too, that I feel she told the entire book with that cover. I think she wasn't going to do it originally, but then I kept pushing her on you because I felt well, like it would write up her all the things that she loves. So, <laughs> Oh, I appreciate that pitch. See, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great to have Chris on your side. <laughs> what challenges and eureka moments occurred while working on this particular project for you? I'm trying to think if there were any um, eureka moments. I mean, it's kind of all stuff that I've done before in terms of getting people to produce. I mean, I think the only... I don't want to say challenging one, but one that was just because only because it was a newer relationship was the one with Anton. Um, I think he got to a point kind of like Stephanie where he felt he was done with it. And I was still kind of pushing him to sort of, there was a central character, central image that kind of was kind of getting lost. And I kind of sort of just jumped in there and said, hey, we need to really pop this image. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you change the color? That was that the event Don Juan of Mycelia with the mushroom guy? Yes. The mushroom yeah, just, and because, when you see it side by side in this interview, you'll see how spectacular that is. Yeah, I think only because, you know, he's kind of new at doing this kind of stuff, too. So a lot of the fantasy stuff he does for himself. <laughs> and then also having to work with a client and somebody who's managing you is not always something people in the fine arts have to do. Like people just leave the artist to their own devices, which is generally fine when you're working for someone else and there's... Um, you know, a client involved and the intent is not to just hang it on the wall, but to get it out there. And there's some other things that have to be taken into consideration. And I hopefully, you know, we I had a talk with Anton as well as I just about general things. And he was appreciative of sort of understanding that's going to be a little bit different than a normal like sort of commission situation. So yeah, that was really the only thing I can think of that was a little different than normal. How did you ensure that the various artistic visions from both Magnus Arts and others aligned with your thematic direction for Event Horizon? And how does the co-publishing come into play? All right, I'll answer the easy, funnier part of co-publishing. That's me being polite. The other publisher is Cyrus Samir Bokin, happens to also be my my husband, partner. Um, so he, <laughs> he, that's all that means. He's more of the smoke a pipe in the background <laughs> aspect of Janice Point Press. And you need that, you know, he's definitely someone uh, along with Aaron that well, first of all, he pushed me to even take a writing class from day one. He's the one that will say, you need to read this book, read this book. You're going to like it. We're going to Greece. You're writing a book in Greece. Let's go to Greece. And we're sitting in an olive field. And he's the one that will say, sit, listen, and write what details you see, right? So he's that kind of cool publisher, right? right. That's all cool publishing means. And also a big art book fan, art collector. <laughs> so in pushes Janice Point Press to be quality. If you ask me, I would be at Staples, printing and stapling. <laughs> like that's my z zinster side. <laughs> <laughs> and to go to your question, well, first pick the right artists, right? This doesn't mean you pick artists that you happen to know or are friends with. You got to look. I mean, you might admire their art, but is their art in line with the style that you're doing? Do you have a budget for that? Doing that up front will help you in the long run for all the other obstacles. I provide good scripts good details, references. Um, I have open communication and maybe critical to this is I feel I have a big openness. I step out of the way. I don't want a Frankenstein piece. I'm not telling an artist, you know, you execute my vision. It's a collaboration. The artist is going to do their own storytelling. I'm going to just, you know, give you the basics. So I very much, you know, stay out of the way. Sometimes, you know, if a piece calls for it and Seth and I are great in this and because we work on all different types of uh, projects and collaborative formats, I do have a strong artistic vision and will say, no, this panel needs to look like this. But I think stepping out of the way and not trying to impose my will, I think you'll get a Frankenstein piece if you do that. 
And then when it didn't work out as originally planned, use your graphic design skills. The canvas, beautiful bluster one canvas that we had, we weren't feeling it when it was just like straight, just like how you see it in a canvas for a book cover. We're like, it's missing something, right? But when Aaron actually flipped it to its side and then had the drips, had the drips pull, it was like a hallelujah moment. And it incorporates that energy that I talked about, the artistic side of like, we put images and you'll see things indented all the way to the right, not in the text that would probably drive you crazy, but in the story openings as being pulled gravity. So graphic design skills, have other people on your team that are going to help you curate, you know, Cyrus, Aaron, and Seth helped me pull some pieces and add some pieces. I mean, Seth, one of our works I wanted in it, we had additional one and he said, no, this doesn't fit your theme, pull it out. So having some no people, not just the yes people on your side ensures quality. For me too, I have to remind myself personality wise and being a woman, hold your ground when your heart says so. If you really feel strongly about something, particularly if it's your own book, say, no, this has to go with the work and this is why. And sometimes it's a conversation to the book designer or artist this is why, just to give you background, I'm not just making this stuff up. This is how everything ties with this little detail that I'm asking for ties to all these other pieces. As Cyrus reminds me, not everyone's in your head, <laughs> you know, like they don't understand your grandmaster plan. So in the very end, if something sings to your heart, stick with it. As a creative person that you are, and of course, a manager of talent at Magnus Arts, what unique perspectives have you brought to the table while collaborating on Event Horizon? And how did you enrich the collection based on your past experiences? That's a great question. My time at Marvel, talent manager there, helped me to help Stephanie casting the right artist, but also even beyond that, casting the type of artist that's going to bring attention to the book because you want to sell the book you know, making the book stand out, refined type of artist that I was sort of, that I learned to, to work with at Marvel brings a different sort of niche type of art into Stephanie's book. Because Stephanie, she was great. She ran the gamut of artists that she's working with. So having the graffiti type of artist, the more maybe less experienced comic book artist or different types of artists, and then me having a sort of a very hardcore sequential artist who's commercial artist and can do everything. And that's sort of a natural talent like Karen who was on the cover. Just sort of being able to understand that there are different types of art out there, that there are people who like different types of art, but each story commands a different type of art. Just understanding those different levels, putting together a project, I think was something that I brought. And then also just like she said, the little the little details here and there that may not seem like much to most people can definitely make something pop more or stand out more on a piece of art. The short story collection aims to challenge readers to consider the boundaries of possibility and consequences of our choices. What do you hope readers will take away from their experience with Avent Horizon? Ooh. Well, I definitely want readers to understand weighing maybe your decisions and their gravity and fully committing to it, right? Um, sometimes the decisions where you're like, eh, whatever, this is what I want. Like, what are some of the consequences to that? Are there people you're going to hurt? Is the world going to blow up? <laughs> you know, are you going to enter a black hole? Um, <laughs> I want readers to also appreciate there's not always a right answer for things. There might be a better answer or an answer for at that time, right? To be a little bit more forgiving. I want people to appreciate that we are products of our past, of our history, but we do have an opportunity to birth ourselves into a new future. So acknowledging like the Sankofa bird principle, looking to the past and just taking that egg of wisdom towards the future. I hope people understand that books not traditionally published can be quality. They're amazing independent artists doing amazing things. Books also don't have to follow formulas. You can bend genre. I thank the Chautauqua Institution honoring me in 2022 with the Janus Prize specifically for my work that does bend genre. We need more spaces that for writers and creators that do those sort of things and don't follow commodity. Human <laughs> sexuality is layered. I want people to appreciate that and sometimes gendered in its perspective. I want people to feel pleasure, curiosity, their intellect be stimulated when they read this book. I'll end with, I hope people are more understanding of people's choices and situations and how their situations may mirror your own unknowingly. Be a little bit more understanding. And space is cool. <laughs> 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 Anything to add, Chris? Stephanie just sort of wrote 
in a few stories that I did read, very layered and nuanced tales, as she says, touched on a lot of human conditions and things that we're going through now, things that all people can relate to. And she sort of did it in a really sophisticated way where it's different layers. So some people will get this level and other people will get this level. So it's whether she did it intentionally or not, she wrote for people's situations, like anybody can sort of access the themes that she's trying to write. And then also just in terms of writing and art, like not everybody reads comics and comics is a very small sort of little People still call it a hobby, um, even though it's a dollar business. Um, <laughs> just getting people to appreciate the visual image, but not only just a visual image, but a visual image that tells a story is really important. You know, we are all instinctually visual people and, uh, you know, we do look at images constantly all day long and not every image tells us a story. So when you have something like this, where it's a little bit more sophisticated and it's trying to get a point across or tell a story or teach a lesson, anything that sort of reports that is, you know, in my book, I wish everybody would read comics because comics are great. Uh, that being said, not everybody wants to read comics or has the money to buy comics all the time. So uh, having something like this, where it's not just like, not just a sequential story, but an illustrated story, uh, you know, piece of cover art that tells a story is a wonderful thing. And the book directly do- tackles that key part that Chris just said, what does one do with image? What does image do to us? It's a key element in Event Horizon, the role of image. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? So this is a great question. It definitely ties into my, when I really started collecting comics seriously. Um, I had early on, I was a teenager, um, I was reading like Batman, G.I. Joe and Transformers because those were like, it's a, it was like a toy thing. And, you know, I liked it. And I was always a reader, even as a kid. But then one day I went to the store and I saw this cool X-Men comic. It was Uncanny X-Men number 205. Chris Claremont and Barry Windsor Smith did the art. You know, I was just kind of sucked into the X-Men. But then as I started collecting more of the X-Men, Chris Claremont's very verbiose and SAT word yeah. late rips sort of really got me into, you know, language, like words, per se, specifically. He used very sophisticated words, but I, I didn't really know what they were at the time. And I always would look them up, you know, kind of just started using them in my, <laughs> in my, as a snobby teenager, just using them in my vocabulary, talking to people. And then just, you know, just reading comic scripts, the, the language that he used, the way he formatted sentences, and he tried to tailor you know, each character with their own type of way, their own way of speaking, even though it was a visual medium, the language that he used uh, to relay the story and to identify the characters um, just became something that kind of stuck with me throughout. So like anytime I read new comic, that's a really, I mean, I know, again, it's a visual medium and it seems kind of counterintuitive to sort of like, I really like how the writer writes, you know, what words they use, what language they use, how they, do they differentiate the the words that are being spoken by different characters. So the language of comics got me even more into the, to the medium as well and just sort of spurned my love of words. <laughs> what do you mean, right? Just get all the credit. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. You ask one team, they say that. The other, I, I don't understand this. I, 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 will say for, <laughs> I will say for my time at Marvel, you know, working in publishing, the writers were the you know the guys in charge. And oftentimes who the art was, the artist was on the book. Not, not 100% of the time, but a lot of times. I guess it's that's all a matter of perspective, right? Yeah, as a comic fan, as a teen, I didn't even know there were writers. Just it was illustrated, like Jim Lee, John Byrne, you know, right. <laughs> or yeah. Adams. Like that's all that existed to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, same thing to me until really until Claremont. Like I really didn't understand that you know it's the writer. It's you know it, it was a t- it's, it's it's a collaborative yeah, right, thing, right. effort. I mean, you can have a writer and have, still have a work of prose, but you can't have a comic without an artist. I mean, you just can't. The words and language are definitely important. Can I say how seen I feel uh, by your response, Chris? Because I joke on shows that I use X Men comics to study for the SATs. Like I did, <laughs> like, and they were Claremonts. No one has ever said that outside of you know my circle, outside of myself. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I didn't do that well in the SATs. Telekinesis and such words were not on there, but like it did challenge me. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, my I, I always did great in, on the spelling bees and stuff like that in school. People like, oh. <laughs> I mean, I don't think many people write like him anymore. He's too verbose or was too verbose. But that being said, it still is like what he did a 17 year run on X-Men that, that I've read, <laughs> you know, and, and definitely say, oh, I probably learned that word from Claremont. <laughs> my fifth grade Val Victorian speech, my dad, I was a Val Victorian. My dad said, you got to always start a speech with a joke. And I think my joke was a funny thing happened to me on my way here. I found out I was graduating, something like that. The audience thought that was hilarious. Well, I thought they thought it was hilarious. They were probably laughing at how bad of a joke that was, but capturing the audience's attention and then giving a speech 
imprinted on my mind, the power of language. Unfortunately, it also gave me a taste. Ah, this is what a dictator must feel like commanding a room. Luckily, I didn't choose the villain track, but it was a moment, probably a decisive moment in my life where I realized the power of words. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? For me, I guess I probably learned this in publishing. Don't be the bad guy. Always try to find a way out of a situation or a compromise. Don't let anyone feel like they've been defeated. You want to, in this business, it's about partnership. So anything you can do to salvage, not burn a bridge, salvage a relationship, build a relationship, make sure that the other person is prosperous or happy is uh, is a good piece of advice because I think it's carried over in all different aspects of life. <laughs> don't be the bad guy. You know, try to figure a way out. Don't step on ants. My dad always said, specifically, God doesn't like those that step on ants. Just because you can step on an ant doesn't mean you should. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh that's a tricky one. I mean, I guess um, I think the, the person that I have to thank mostly for my love of reading, of science fiction, of fantasy is my grandmother. As a young kid, she was an opera singer. She was in the arts, but she read she, like she had this amazing like library of books. <laughs> like she had like two closets, bookshelves full of books. And I was always like in there playing in there, like using it for my action figures. But then I started looking at the books like Egypt, like I got really into dinosaurs because she had all these books on archaeology, spurring my love of dinosaurs and of course, which led to Godzilla. But then she had a, I think the first book she told me she gave me to read was because she kind of saw like I was into like the horror stuff and science fiction. She gave me um, the interview with a vampire to read because she was, she loved vampires. And I read that book and as another person who's verbose <laughs> uses and writes a lot of sophisticated language. I read that book and I kind of got sucked, like, you know, sucked into it on a more mature level than reading like Batman and G.I. Joe comics. So, yeah, I think my grandmother sort of, at least in the sense of the love of the written word and love of fantasy. Yeah, my grandmother, <laughs> Johanna. <laughs> the sucks reference was was a good pun for Interview with the Vampire. Well done. Oh, yeah. They... <laughs> See, it's all it's all connected. It's all connected. <laughs> From a professional perspective, you have you both have been. Uh, amazing professionals in your respective fields from comics to talent management to health and many other industries that I'm sure we haven't touched on yet that we will in the future. So just means you'll all have to come back on the show in the, in the future. So from a professional perspective, you are all successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, that's a weird, that's a, that's a tricky question. Probably not, but I'm trying <laughs> or I'm still trying. I mean, I guess in di on, at different things. Monetarily, I'd like to, I wish I had more money or I can make a lot more money doing this, but you know, it's sort of getting there and building up to it. I like doing it. I mean, it's something I'm passionate about. So I feel successful in that. I worked at Marvel for 11 years. So I always wanted to work there. So I got to do that. So that's success in my book. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm always like a lot of us sort of berating myself or saying, you could do better. You could do better. You could be better. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? That's again, that's a sort of a loaded question. You know, I try to learn from it, learn from them, you know, try to be better the next time. If a failure involves hurting someone or maybe not intentionally, but like sort of someone else suffers for it, um, I, I don't, I try my best not to get into those kind of situations. Those are really the only kind of failures that I think failure is like if it affects someone else. If it's on me, it's, I don't really look at it as a failure. I just look at it as a learning experience and just try to be better the next time or do better. Think more about it. Think how I could have done it differently. The basic thing we can all do is just learn from our failures, our bad experiences, and just do better the next time. The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's in comics or film or some other medium. Maybe you're inspiring them down that particular path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I mean, when it comes to art, you know, it is a visual medium. I mean, I think you're just, I think when newer artists look at current artists, in my case, current, you know, working people that are working in the industry whose art is out there, like, you know, on a monthly basis or semi-regular basis, just seeing that uh, and knowing that it's possible, I think it's inspirational. From my end, I mean, if I talk to new artists, I just try to give them all the information I feel like artists didn't get when I was sort of working, like things that they didn't know, like, the real basic kind of mechanics, like having a work for hire agreement, don't be afraid to negotiate, be a good communicator, try to give them practical tools. And then if I start working with them, 
seeing their art and how they approach the process, I can give them more, I guess, different ways of thinking to help them sort of get their art out there. Um, but really just giving people the tools who don't have the, the knowledge of working in a specific industry so that they don't get taken advantage of, first of all. But learning that it's, you can, there are different ways to make money. There are different ways to build relationships. And don't be afraid. You know, just you're an artist. If you're an artist, you can draw and you can depict anything. Try to keep that in the back of your mind when you're going into a work, a working relationship or a new relationship. You can do anything, really. And don't be afraid of that. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, God. Okay. The soundtrack part, I think, is easier. It would be probably a combination of Depeche Mode and Madonna. <laughs> uh, what would it be? I don't know. I mean, I have I have a love of all different things, like science fiction, fantasy, drama, melodrama. I mean, I'm half Italian, half Spanish, so there's melodrama in the blood. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> um, I don't know. That's, that's really a tricky one. I mean, I would say, like, a cross between, like, x-men aliens and interview with a vampire like kind of thing like i don't know it's just very weird sort of <laughs> heavy on the drama i guess because um, that's that's just a human condition and it's all about the drama <laughs> well stephanie and chris i do hate to say it but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you both for coming on the show thanks for having us yeah thank you it was really great pleasure before i let you both go where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is Event Horizon? When does it end? Because we didn't touch on the Kickstarter campaign. Apologies. Uh, and and uh, anything else you both would like to promote? So you could check out Event Horizon, Stories of No Turning Back, live now on Kickstarter through May 10th. We are ending on NASA's Black Hole Week, May 10th. Um, you can find us either at JanusPointPress.com, J-A-N-U-S Press.com, or if you're familiar with Kickstarter, just head to their website, Kickstarter.com, type in Event Horizon, we will pop up. You can find me um, as Stephanie um, in social media as The Nina Galaxy. Um, and you can also follow Janice Point Press on Instagram, uh, JanicePoint.Press. We hope to see you there. Chris? Uh, yeah, um, Blue Sky, Facebook, X, uh, Magnus Arts. Um, check us out there. Um, I don't really have a big social media presence, so working on that. <laughs> so many wonderful creators, I will say, don't have a website, so don't be fooled by that. The trailer person that I use for Event Horizon also didn't have a website, delivered a fabulous. So sometimes the best things are kept secret or a little bit harder to find. <laughs> <laughs> that ends this particular episode, unfortunately. My website's been going through a revamp and rebuild for the past 10 or so years. So you can find all of these interviews, 1,200 in fact, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back because I dusted it off. And you can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help find that out. Thanks for listening and watching on to Geeks Talking.